welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And as usual, I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And this week, I'm really happy to welcome onto the show, Nicole Dixon. Nicole, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Sam. It's an honor and a privilege. Yeah, I really uh, appreciate you making time for us. Um, so, you know, just to briefly say a little bit about you by way of introduction, uh, you're born in Oakland, California. And in 2002, you received a BA in studio art at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. And in addition to uh, exhibiting paintings, you've produced commissioned works like family portraits and home murals uh, for well over a decade. And you use art as an interactive medium, a vehicle for self-transformation, community bridge building, positive social change. All true. (laughs) <laughs> all true and all good things. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we started uh, interacting, I guess, you know, a month or so ago, uh, as uh, you know, I teach at the University of San Francisco, and their art gallery, the Thatcher Art Gallery had this really wonderful exhibit. And I got to see your work there. And we had an event and we got to meet and chat a little bit. And I immediately thought, I have to have you on this program to talk with you more, because uh, your art is clearly evoking a lot of the issues and kind of the power that comes out of this intersection of religion and ecology, right, which is what the podcast is all about. So I wonder if we can kind of just start with that, um, you know, especially as a podcast, we're not showing the art, so we can just kind of talk about it and, uh, and explore what it means uh, that way through the kind of verbal medium. So how would you describe the way that your art kind of navigates this intersection of religion and ecology or spirituality and nature and, and and there's definitely politics and social issues kind of woven in there as well. Many things, many things, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting because up until this show, I hadn't really thought about my art in an ecological context per se. I always knew that it, um, you know, was posited within this socio-political uh, context um, and that it had spiritual undertones and overtones, um, but I hadn't really thought about it as ecological. And I got really excited um, to have this new lens really to be able to look at it and think about it. Um, you know, art always has surprises for you. So um, that was definitely a surprise. Um, essentially, the aim of my work um, is to center um, Blackness, right? Black bodies, Black experience, Black identity for a few different reasons. Um, Number one, as uh, as an African-American woman, I'm having many experiences in the skin, right? And those experiences um, are very intersectional, right? So they do cross so many realms, right? Um, and so as a, as a person, I'm taking from many different sources um, and, and using all the areas of life, really of my particular life to make work that, that speaks to me, um, to, make work, to make work that comes from my experience um, and that really has this this overarching purpose of being a touchstone, um, you know, so that I can look at images of black bodies, unapologetically black um, bodies that are exactly um, who and how I see blackness and how I experience blackness, right? So I'm um, rendering figures in charcoal, which is a very, very black medium, right? Um, And these figures are surrounded by and empowered by um, cultural symbols, um, a lot of Adinkra symbols from from West Africa, um, sacred geometry symbols, right? And and also uh, a lot of natural imagery, you know, images of birds and and other animals, flowers with all of their different medicinal powers and all of their different, um, you know, all of the different meanings that we ascribe to them. And essentially, I would really want the goal of having, um, you know, my work in a public sphere, the goal really is to help shift the narrative around Blackness and Black bodies, Um, you know, because as we know that the stories that people tell um, in their own minds when they look at Black men, women, and children and project those stories onto Black men, women, and children can really cost people their lives and and does again and again, it has for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, um, you know, when I'm making these these images that are beautiful and whole and spiritual and rooted in 
culture um, and and that are powerful. Um, you know, when when viewers get a chance to interact with with my work and when they get a chance to really have this kind of energetic exchange, when they get a chance to feel beauty. Um, and, and I'm hoping that they can continue to identify that beauty and those same positive feelings with, with blackness when they walk on onto the street and when they encounter black people in their lives. So um, there are a lot of different intersections, um, you know, because I am certainly a person who's been trying to integrate um, Throughout my life, you know, I'm, I'm drawing from the spiritual and all my spiritual experiences, drawing from the social political context that I'm in, right? Drawing from nature also, um, and which is one of the reasons why I was excited about this last show um, at, at USF, because really getting a chance to look to nature and look at nature and learn lessons from nature um, and really being able to apply that to my work and to my life has been um, really inspiring too. So I, it is very multidimensional and intersectional um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Multidimensional and intersectional for sure. Yeah, I appreciate the point about charcoal as well. I know one of the things that struck me initially seeing your work was like, oh, this isn't just black. This is black. There's a there's a, such mm -hmm. a depth to that, and that's so powerful. So I was immediately very struck by it. You can't walk through the gallery without without kind of having some kind of emotional response to that. Just just by virtue of the blackness, like well, that's, that's the goal. How do you do that? It draws uh, you in, and it's yeah. just burnt wood. Also, it's really a natural material. It's burnt wood, and you get to just smush it around the page with your fingers. It's amazing. That sounds fun. Uh, I like the idea of smushing things around the page. Uh, and it's a good example of how, you know, all art has a kind of ecological dimension just by virtue of the fact that you're working with with media, right, which are always material. And uh, you know, so another one of the things I wanted to talk about was was how media figures into what you're doing, you know, like things like the burnt wood or the charcoal. And I know you do mixed media work as well. So it seems like your home base is kind of in painting, but really you do, you're really branching out. Yes, definitely. I think probably by now it's been close to 20 years that I've been exploring mixed media. Um, and I think it really just kind of emerged out of my own personal development as an artist. Um, you know, again, I had so many experiences that I wanted to express on paper, um, as most artists do. Um, and I wanted my work to be very personal. I wanted to make a statement, et cetera. Um, but I began to really want, you know, a, a lot of the pieces I was making were powerful, but they weren't necessarily anything that someone would want to hang up in their living room or, you know, on the consumer end. And they also weren't weren't pieces that were nourishing me. Right. They were. Um, there's a difference between just expressing something. Right. And then having that expression be, have a transcendent purpose. And I kind of really wanted to I, I just had a yearning for um, for more cathartic work. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just expressive work. And so I, it, it was very, a very intuitive evolution. I think I just started to experiment with a lot of the mediums that I was working with as a young child even. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because, you know, speaking about ecology, it's interesting because there are so many materials available to us in nature, right? Um, nature is very plural. That's probably maybe, if there's one truth in nature, it's probably that nature is plural. Um, and, and there's so many different materials available. And I, I started to kind of grab and, and uh, look for materials that had certain vibrations, um, certain energy, certain resonance. Wood has a certain um, softness yet hardness, right? A certain density. Um, charcoal has a certain depth, right? Even, even paint and pigments have a certain resonance. Gold, uh, use a lot of gold leaf. It has this reflective quality and the sunlight dances across it. You know, uh, magazine papers, I use a lot of magazine papers to represent the mundane world um, in, as in collage some cityscapes, right? And it has like this slickness and this glossiness, you know, that you can't really get in other ways. Cloth and fabric, I use a lot of cloth and fabric for added texture and dimension. So really um, drawing, from, um, drawing from nature in my materials and also just trying to combine whatever I had around me and whatever was available really gave this, dy this um, dynamism 
to to my work that it felt more like it was it was um, a better way to reflect the complexity of the themes that I was trying to present. Um, so you know, and nature ecology uh, really plays itself out in a lot of different ways in my work in the the materials themselves, but also you know thematically as well, um, because when I'm talking about my experience as a black woman, I'm talking about my experience within a context, within an environment, right? Which my, my ecological experience as a, as a black woman walking through this world, right? Um, and then also um, iconographically as well. So I, I may take some elements from nature, but I also render na natural symbols, right? A lot of flowers or herbs or plants or birds and animals, um, which, in and of it themselves, just the image holds a certain power and a certain resonance and a certain quality. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, so mixed media, I, I don't, I mean, I love also, I love painting, I love drawing, I could do watercolor, I could do, you know, but being able to layer and mix the mediums together just gives this quality and this dimension um, that I haven't been able to really get with just one material. Yeah, that's really remarkable to me because I don't know, I don't really do much with like visual art. I have some musical training, which is a very different world. And uh, one of the things I'm always kind of envious of, of, you know, people who work with visual media is that like when you see wood, you don't see the same wood I see. You see just, like, all this power and this potential in it. And so it's like, it's not just that nature kind of transforms your art, but then like your art then changes the way you see nature. And so like, when I see a mag glossy magazine cover, I'm not thinking, oh, this is such a great way to think about the mundane world. And then when I see it in your art, I'm like, well, of course. And it kind of seems obvious then. Uh, so yeah, I'm wondering what that's like. Like just, uh, you know, how how do you see the world? That You mentioned kind of a resonance and stuff like, you know, what's, what's this resonance about? And, and how do I get it? <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I think you probably have it. Uh, you know, I'm a little jealous of people who can just open their mouths and then the most beautiful harmonious notes come out, right? Or your fingers just go flying across the keys or, you know, the, the strings. And then, and then, you know, as this vibration is sent out into the universe, you know, maybe a bird will sing back to you or maybe your song is influenced by the notes of a bird. Or, you know, it's, I think that's one of the, the um, biggest treasures of, of this show and of this type of a forum um, is really opening us all up to just the reality that we're in, that everything is intersectional. Everything is intersectional and everything is um, reflexive, right? So um, whatever our creative practice is, uh, you know, as we're working, it's going to be teaching us, right? As we're connecting with, with nature, quote unquote, connecting with nature, because clearly we are part of nature, right? But if we are in our minds thinking of ourselves as connecting to nature and reaching out to nature, she's reaching back to us, right? It's 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 completely interactive. And of course, you know, my brain wants to really master, I really want to master some of everything. And I don't mean master as in dominate, I mean master as in maximize my relationship with, right? Um, so I want to, I want to know more about like, quantum physics and how the observer changes what's being observed right you know and Octavia Butler talked about all that you touch you change right and all you change changes you right that that's we, we lived in a closed loop you know um and there's a reason for that we live on this big Mobius strip and um and if more of us you know were aware of that this probably probably wouldn't be in the state our planet wouldn't be in the state that it is right now um but it's also a constant source of inspiration. So I, you know, I do get really inspired by all sorts of things that I see and come across. And, you know, I think that most people can sense energy and vibrations and materials. You know, it feels different to us when we're standing in a desert versus standing in a forest versus standing on the beach, right? There's a reason for that. Um, there's, there's vibration everywhere. We're nothing but little particles of energy vibrating all around anyway, you know? Um, yeah. So I could go on and on and on about it. <laughs> and I could, I I've just have this insatiable quest. I just want to know all the science behind it all and all the math behind it. I know that we're living in a mathematical world and, you know, so a little bit of that comes through. Um, 
in my in my work, but that's it's that's really the source, the the, the primordial soup um, where this work emerges. Yeah, that's great. I like the, uh, the kind of cosmological dimension of, of kind of your thinking and your creative process. Because a lot of people when they think of ecology, it just kind of stops with you know animals and plants and things like that, and it doesn't always get down to like the basic building blocks of the whole universe. And that just really opens it up to such a bigger horizon and one that seems like scientific, but also spiritual. Definitely. And so Definitely. you're not really separating the scientific world and the spiritual world. It's kind of, well, there's one energy there. And couldn't even if I tried, I mean, you know, and every time you ask a scientific question, you get a spiritual answer. Every time you ask a spiritual question, you get a scientific answer. And it's all one big, you know, it's all one big, amazing story. I don't, you know, whoever wrote this, quite genius. Um, and also probably a little diabolical at the same time. Um, and and probably laughing, um, even now, probably laughing. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all connected. Everything is connected. And I'm just one little person doing, you know, following my intuition and you know, following inspiration wherever it guides me and just trying to be um, obedient to all the truths that I believe, you know, um, and trying to just do what I can. Yeah, I like, I like story as a kind of way to bring it all together. Because obviously science has its own narratives, religions have their narratives, like, yeah, these are just all ways of kind of telling our story and connecting with the story that just is the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I don't know, in, in you know, academic circles, people are always worried about the science religion dialogue and they're always kind of butting heads. And like, you know, they're not necessarily separate things. Not at all. And not <laughs> contradiction either. Yeah. <laughs> not necessarily in contradiction either. Yeah, they don't have to fight with each other. Yeah, it's it's really such an odd thing with the modern mind of kind of compartmentalize the world, carve everything up, and then mm -hmm. treat us like we're separate from nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then That's right. And then you tell people, you know, you're part of nature and then they think that, but they still like feel separate. Very so I appreciate your, your artistic work is actually opening up that emotional space for us to feel these interconnections, not just know them in our heads, but to like really feel it. Absolutely. And to embody them because this, you know, this is where we came from. It's how we evolved, you know, and there's so many lessons to be learned, um, for anyone who's interested in learning, you know, all we have to do is walk outside and take a look around. There's so many lessons, you know, um, and I, hopefully people are really starting to awaken to that, or at least starting to pay attention to that, you know, with um, all the um, the indigenous um, folks that are rising up right now, and um, and the indigenous. Um, folks who are amplifying their voices to really um, try to help save us all, uh, be, you know, before it's too late. Uh, for, in a lot of ways, it's already too late, but we're going to just keep plucking away, right? Keep chipping away at the beast until um, until we try to right this ship a bit. Um, but yes, there are, there are definitely lessons everywhere. Um, you know, and even in some, some work uh, for the, the last show, I was, um, you know, inspired to to learn a little bit more about the redwood trees and their process of, um, of healing from wounds or injuries um, or fires. Um, and, you know, anywhere we look in nature, we can find a lesson for how to manage something in our own lives um, better, right? For how to, uh, I was using the, the redwood trees process of, of growing new bark, um, around new cells around their wounds and just still being able to be these great magnificent giants that can live for thousands of years and they still have every single wound they carry every single wound inside of them right as a and was using that as um a, a lesson in how to grieve um you know and as i'm trying to figure out my own process with grief my own relationship to grief looking to the redwood trees as a teacher right we can look you know we can look to how nothing is ever wasted in nature um you know as a really big lesson i'm i'm trying to do that right now and not being be so wasteful with food you know or with water right there's so many lessons to be learned i'm just i just happen to be integrating them into art um but i know in in the usf show there was also a film that was um 
shown as well and you play music and I'm sure you know you're vibrating with whatever inspires you you know in nature so we all we all have our part we all have our part yeah I like the idea especially that we can kind of start where we are you're like just go outside look around and there's already all these lessons to be learned yeah. not some kind of far off thing like how will i ever learn these lessons like no they're all around us all the time every single moment yep and every moment is a new chance you know that's one of the things i find most inspiring because it can be hard you know to feel guilty about what we're not doing, um, but you know, to feel guilty about all the craziness that's happening in the world or to feel um, disheartened, disillusioned, frustrated, hopeless, you know, but nature shows us that every single moment that we're breathing is another chance, you know, another chance. And there's no judgment around it, you know, and, and this is where, um, you know, religion can play a role, right? Um, sometimes there are certain religions where people interpret a lot of judgment, you know, but look at the planet, you know, the, the planet's not judging, it's just renewing itself, you know, it's just trying again, um, you know, despite what we're doing to it, right? So um, yeah, there, when we judge ourselves, I think, it, it can be really difficult to move forward. Um, but that doesn't mean not being honest with ourselves. It doesn't mean not being reflective or shining a light or trying to do better or taking accountability. All those things are, are equally important, um, but we have to feel that it's possible. And every moment is another, is a new possibility, another chance. Yeah, I think of like the redwood, right? Yeah, it's being honest that it's burned Absolutely. and that it's wounded, but no judgment. It doesn't get yeah. mad at fire. <laughs> it just grows uh, yeah. no matter what. It just grows. Yeah. Yeah. And it also does protect itself. You know, it, it, um, it, it has like this twofold process where it will um, secrete protective defensive things as well as growing new cells. Right. So um, and that's where truth plays a really big part, right? That's where narrative plays a really big part. Um, you know, in this world right now, in this country right now, um, there are people who really wanna hold on to certain stories and they only wanna teach certain stories, right? Um, but when we look at the truth, um, we can all, you know, for lack of a better phrase, everybody can be set free um, because nothing good's gonna happen if, the tr if we don't start from a place of truth, right? Um, but, but as long as, there's, you know, every scar is there in the redwood and, um, and she grows anyway, right? Mm -hmm. she just, she withstands and she grows anyway. Yeah, such a powerful example of, of resilience. And especially, I mean, these days, more and more people are talking about, you know, ecological grief and needing to learn like new ways to grieve. Like the problems we're facing on such a scale, like we, we aren't used to this. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, and you're like, well, we could kind of just look around and we have all these great role models for how to deal with trauma and grief, especially Redwoods have a historical trauma. They're like, yeah, we've been around for a few thousand years. Exactly. We've seen, seen everything stuff. you could possibly complain about. We've seen it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything you possibly have, everything you've even thought about enduring, everything your ancestors endured. We were right here. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, seen whole empires rise and fall. Yeah, we've been here the whole time. We're here. We've been <laughs> just, here. Exactly. Just growing. Growing, yeah. withstanding and growing anyway. And we will, they will be here after whatever us humans are doing, however it ends, you know, they'll, they'll be here. They'll still be here afterwards. Absolutely. So I'm trying to take my cue, trying to take my cue from the Redwoods for sure. Yeah. For sure. That's great. It's a great example, especially, you know, living up here in Northern California, that that's a, that touches deeply for sure. Absolutely. And I can go physically also to the Redwoods, lucky, you know, lucky enough to be able to go and feel that vibration and get that healing before diving back into the city, you know, and diving back into the work and diving back into the trauma and dri diving back into the injustice and that, you know, um, I'm definitely very grateful for being able to to unplug at times and get some, you know, and restore myself. Yeah, that's so important. And I think sometimes people feel like it's an either or, like you either have to choose technology or nature. It's like, no, we can, we can figure out a nice balance. And it's like, no, we can still be in the city, yeah. still have that life, mm -hmm. but you got to figure out how to recharge yourself, nourish yourself, and mm -hmm. learn the lessons of the universe. 
and then come back and get on our computers again. Then. <laughs> That's right. And, and come back and hopefully change technology for the better, help evolve technology for the better, learn our cues, you know, take our lessons from nature and try not to destroy the planet that we're living on. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was really helpful. It's a simple suggestion. Yeah, how about let's just not destroy the planet. How about that? Like, oh, that's a good idea. We should have really thought of this a while ago. A while ago. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, speaking of you know the way redwoods grow, I, I think a lot about you know, nurturing growth in terms of the work that educators do. You know, that's the main thing I do is, is see myself as an educator. Sometimes I'll write things. I don't really think of myself as a writer more of a teacher than a writer mm -hmm. and uh and so i know i was interested to learn that you also are a teacher yeah and uh so you know anytime somebody's kind of juggling two worlds like that the world of education and the world of art i'm always interested to hear about uh the you know talking about intersections that's another really big intersection mm -hmm. uh so i wonder if you can say a little bit about that what's your experience as an educator and then how does like your creative process come into that how does art figure in absolutely well you know, in order to teach, you kind of have to be a lifelong student, you know, it's a, you know, it's definitely a reflexive process, uh, especially if that's part of your pedagogy, and it certainly is um, part of mine. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly learning as a teacher, I'm constantly revising, and I'm, I'm constantly um, reflecting on my myself my presence my my contribution how i affect you know how what effect i'm having on the students and there i'm reflecting on their effect on me as well you know so it's we we definitely can speak of the ecology of the classroom for sure um and what happens in that environment um and you know i think in general as a teacher wanting to really grow and as a person um, wanting to grow at, and be a better and better teacher, you know, every day, every year, um, the children really, I, I'm just grateful that they really give me that, opp that opportunity, you know, um, and, and as I'm trying to help them grow as well, right? And my my job is really to prepare their environment, to just give them an environment in which they can grow, right? In which they can explore their own creativity, in which they can develop their own identities, and in an environment really to prepare an environment in which they can see the their purpose, right? They can their purpose can be revealed to them through their experiences in my classroom, right? They can see that they are connected to everything right um that they're needed um you know and that they have special gifts that we all can't live without you know the future depends on them um and and in that process i i really find myself kind of doing the same thing as an artist you know um and of course, I also try to provide an environment where children can explore their own creativity as well, right? They can explore different mediums, just like I was able to do. Um, and they can awaken the artists within themselves, of course. Um, but also as an artist, you know, I'm always also trying to just integrate, trying to, you know, trying to clear my channel, my internal channel, so that I can, um, you know, have inspiration, be inspired and follow my guidance. Um, and, and, you know, and manifests, you know, use my, in order to do that, you kind of have to empty your channel, right? Um, remember what you're supposed to remember, and surrender to this, to this, to the muse um, or, you know, and follow it where it takes you. And you kind of have to do a lot of surrendering in the classroom as a teacher as well. Um, and so I, I feel like it's, they're very similar um, processes, um, teaching and creating. And then of course there, there are other intersections, you know, like, like being able to, um, to help children find their own artistic expressions as well. Um, but it is, it is, it is all about the environment, you know, that that I help to prepare for the children and the environment that I am um, participating in with them, the environment that I'm learning and growing in with them, you know, we're creating this environment together in the classroom um, for the greatest good. And that, you know, the same thing is true with, with my work um, as an artist as well. Nice, yeah, I like that uh, idea of the classroom as its own ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people think about education as just 
putting knowledge inside of kids heads oh it's like no it's totally the opposite you're providing a nurturing place for them so you're just like no i don't have to put anything in absolutely them. absolutely and what comes from them naturally is just i could not make this stuff up it's hilarious it's amazing it's inspiring it teaches me it checks me all the time yeah they're definitely my comrades and um and my teachers as well so and they know they know their teachers um they know they have a lot to contribute yeah i like that a lot it's uh such an empowering way to think about the educational process like no, we're all teachers here some of us are just younger than others we all That's have different right. lessons for each other but That's right. and you, you talk about purpose a lot for with your art and your uh teaching so i wonder if you could say a little bit more about that i think it's so crucial and i think it's something that's it's sadly been pretty lost in modern society. A lot of people don't feel purpose and, and they don't know that if it even exists. Like, does the universe even have a purpose? Absolutely. Like, oh my. <laughs> that <laughs> yes. seems pretty oh, dark. Man. Yes, absolutely. I think also one of the ways that we can know that purpose is really important is by just by looking at what happens when people don't have a sense of purpose they find people will find a sense of purpose even if it's a problematic one even if it's um you know they will they will uphold the banner of whatever they say they believe in spite of all the evidence to the contrary right so people are really really as human beings we it, i think it, there's just something I mean, everything, honestly, if you think about, we just have to look to nature for the answers, right? Like when a, when a baby grasshopper is born, it knows its purpose. It's not going to go around trying to swing from trees and eat bananas. It's going to do what's programmed into it, right? Like every, everything is, every living thing, every spark of life has a purpose um, and knows its purpose. And in nature, in nature, meaning non-human, in the non-human uh, world um everything is really serving its purpose you know and you can see how things are interrelated and interconnected and you can see the balance you know you can see the purpose of difficult things in nature you know as one creature consumes another that that energy and that life is surrendered in order for you know for the the bigger the bigger quote-unquote creature to live or as bacteria is consuming you know the the body of this massive whale or whatever it is, you know we can see that everything in nature has a purpose um and i i think because this the western society or um you know imperialist society has confused i think they are able to just really confuse purpose you know does the purpose of humanity or does the purpose of someone's particular cultural identity have to be to dominate everything into oblivion like is that really a beneficial purpose for the world, I mean, maybe it's thrilling. I mean, if you, I guess if you're empty and you don't have anything else to identify with, then that's your purpose, right? Um, uh, so yeah, that's a big problem. Um, it's a big problem, it's a seriously big problem. But you know, when people, when some people are finding greater purpose right now in this time of such hardship, such visible hardship, because, you know, truth be told, this is kind of the same old, same old right now for a lot of communities. It's just a lot more visible right now or visible in different ways. Um, but I think people are finding more purpose in, tr in like this reckoning that's happening right now, you know, um, a reckoning around justice and humanity or, you know, and a reckoning with, um, you know, with the planet and what's happening all around us. Um, I, I think I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of tap into a sense of purpose at a pretty young age. Um, and I was actually in one of my uh, early child development classes, I was taking a class on um, violence and resilience. And, you know, there are a few pillars uh, that, that um, scientists have been able to kind of distill out of um, young children, you know, who've gone through violent experiences. There's a few pillars of resilience. And I was surprised to learn that one of them is a sense of mastery. So that if a child is is able to kind of develop a sense of mastery or have a sense of mastery around something or pursue a, a goal, you know, in the pursuit of mastery, then it really contributes to them being resilient as opposed to, to children who don't recover um, from their experiences. And I definitely was able at a young age to find, you know, art um, 
and, and really kind of um and really kind of throw myself into wanting to um wanting to grow wanting to learn wanting to get better wanting to refine wanting to kind of master the tools around me um and that sense of mastery is very linked to you know my purpose i found a lot of different purposes for being here luckily um and they're all equally inspiring um but I think that definitely if if people were really able to uh, purpose is really linked with identity, um, because without purpose, it's hard to to have an identity. Um, and I think that's what what people are clamoring for in very negative ways. They want to belong. They want to have this identity that's, you know, boy, oh boy. And they're clinging to it with every fiber of their being. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's such a helpful distinction between you know, mastery versus domination mm-hmm. you can see this kind of confused attempt to find that purpose mm-hmm. but instead of mastery i mean if you're if you're really like mastering an instrument or you're mastering an art form you can't control it absolutely you have to let it control you you kind of talked about emptying out the channel right absolutely and yeah. so you kind of let you lift it up and you say, That's okay, right. I have to follow you if I'm going to figure out how to do this thing. And That's the domination right. just gets that completely backwards. It's just and control, control. For real. And that leads to destruction every single time, for a catastrophic destruction every single time. Absolutely. Yeah, That's right. True. Like that's so the root of, of all of our problems, sexism, racism, poverty, environmental mm-hmm. destruction. In each case, there's always this power over Absolutely. coming in with domination. It's like, no, that's... You confused your purpose. You're, yeah, you got a little confused there, buddy. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's the nice yeah. non-judgmental way to put it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is a hard attitude to hold. I, I definitely feel very judgmental sometimes when I think about <laughs> this. I'm like, oh, yeah. I know. That's one of the mm-hmm. gifts of, of teaching young children, though, you know, to be a preschool teacher. And, and you know, I'm a Montessorian as, as well, which gives me a, um, a very specific narrative, um, a very specific every set of narratives to fall back on and be, you know one of the gifts of being with young children is that you can't I can't stay down you know I can't stay judgmental everything's I I see the potential of every moment in all of my students you know um and I'm and they're teaching me and I'm getting better and better you know mm-hmm. um becoming a better student every year yeah. yeah I you know uh grew up and knew some people who went to Montessori schools and it wasn't until you know much later that I realized what interesting you know kind of philosophy of teaching is really there, including the kind of cosmic connections. It's like yeah. oh, we're all connected to the universe, and I was like, well, why didn't anybody bring that into my school? <laughs> Absolutely, don't get me started talking about Montessori because I that would be a whole other podcast. I could talk <laughs> about. Um, the fascinating, amazing woman that Dr. Maria Montessori was forever and ever and ever. And I could talk about the, you know, the applications and implications for um, for what her rigorous scientific mind really discovered about the human spirit. And uh, I could talk about that forever. But yes, I'm, I'm definitely able to use the Montessori method um, you know, for all of the purposes that we've highlighted today, you know, and to help children really um, develop such a rich and uh, and significant identity, you know, um, as it relates to our whole world. All right. Well, I'll have to have you back on to talk about Montessori sometime <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Montessori of, and ecology. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah definitely. Uh, well, for now, I want to get back a little bit more into your work as an artist and, you know, talking about this kind of thing of like surrendering and, you know, emptying the channel, really following the creative impulse we're in a society that's always telling you not to do that it's just like no be productive and just be part of the machine and all that and and don't notice your surroundings just go to work and you know and kind of sit sit in your desk and don't explore your creativity so how did how did you find yourself on this path you know that i always like no you see somebody who does cool work you go how did you get to this point and what was the kind of practice the training or the life-changing events, you know, what, what, how did you find this kind of path? Well, I think it definitely is an intersection, of course, you know, talking about intersectionality um, of a lot of different factors. I mean, on a, on a physical level, um, 
you know, in my, in my home, I was lucky enough to have a lot of love and support, um, an, an enormous family, um, the uh, enormously supportive family. And I was able to, I had the, the resources to be able to just have materials around, you know, to explore and experiment with. So, um, and, and then, you know, once my mother saw that I was interested in art, you know, that I was always kind of, um, always making something and uh, and that I had this kind of a strange child brain well not strange a very typical child brain that wanted to learn you know more um, and wanted to master then um, she sent me to a, a nonprofit um, summer arts camp um, since age 11 and that program is still around it's called the junior center for arts and science um, it's a wonderful program and I've I really feel like I learned most of my technical skills as an artist, um, you know, at age 11, 12, 13, over the summers there. Um, yes, I went on to college um, and became uh, an art major in college. Um, most of my technical skills were learned, you know, from this little nonprofit, which was really a gift. Um, in college, I did have a lot of uh, professors, I, I chose, I deliberately chose to go to an intimate college that could really nurture, help nurture my identity. So I chose to go to an HBCU, um, you know, and, and in particular to a woman's college, I wanted kind of the smallest bubble possible to kind of help refine myself. Um, and I had lots of wonderful professors there that really invested in me as a person and really challenged me um, as an artist. I think kind of the through line, um, the thread that kind of taught it all together is really just, um, you know, speaking about this forum on ecology and religion, it really was just this, this kind of sense of spirituality, sense of a spiritual identity that I've always had. That, and I was also a kind of a stubborn Virgo child and no one could really tell me anything different than, you know, I was having these very clear experiences. And so whenever someone tried to give me their, their story, if it didn't jive with what I knew to be true, it wasn't happening for me. Um, so I, I definitely have always since a very, very, very very young child, some of my earliest memories are of knowing and understanding um, that I am here in this body for a finite amount of time and that I, I came from someplace else that wasn't all the, the all these shenanigans and that uh, one day I will go back there if I just learn my lessons, right? Do, do, do what I'm here to do, figure out my purpose, do it well, and then I could go, right? So I've, I've always had this yearning to kind of escape samsara, you know, to kind of get on out and just go be some colors in the nebula somewhere. Um, so this, you know, and, and I think that that um, that identity, you know, this this cosmic identity that I always had, um, led me to a lot of different practices that were just good for me. Intuitively, led me to a lot of practices that were really good for me before they became trendy or before, you know, um, you know, I was I was drawn to. I, when I was a, a tiny child, my mother had this paperweight that was made out of a crystal and occasionally I would get headaches. And for some reason, I just knew if I just put that crystal, you know, or I would like take my fingers and kind of pull the headache out of my head, you know, or, you know, numbers had a lot of meaning to me. I was a quirky kid, right? So numbers had a lot of meaning to me. And I would memorize back in the day before cell phones, I would memorize everyone's phone number and kind of like add numbers up on the calculator and they would have a certain meaning, you know? Um, so I just kind of intuitively knew some truths about the universe that helped to contribute to um, to my identity as a spiritual person, um, as, a, as a spirit and just in this body for now. Um, and I think that certainly contributed to my, you know, it's one of the undercurrents of my work really is that we're, we're spiritual beings um, here for a reason. That's such a great example of a uh, time when stubbornness is a really great quality to have. Yes. And you're like, no, no, that's not who you are. You're like, yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, mm, what, are you, what story are you trying to tell me about? Who did? Mm. Sorry, guys, but um, yeah. yeah. Look, I, can't, I couldn't make this stuff up even if I tried. You know, three-year-old <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really make up these types of experiences, you know. So yeah, I do. right. Yeah, and then it turns out all those, all those things you're doing have roots and deep traditions you know reiki and numerology Absolutely. and sacred geometry like yeah i didn't think i was making it up no, i wasn't exactly i know i wasn't off yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. 
yeah so just staying you know and and that's what i mean by keeping the channel clear is you know not completely void and empty right not completely emptying but just keeping it pure keeping you know keeping the channel rooted in what i know to be true um and keeping in mind that i also know that my truths um aren't true unless they are for the greater good as well, right? Unless they serve the greater good, right? Just because I believe something is true, if it is harming other people or harming the planet or harming communities, or harm, then it's, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to um, flip that truth around in a few different ways, spin that truth around in a few ways until you find the kernel of truth there that doesn't actually do other folks harm. Um, oh sure. yeah, that's such an important point. If you're like, no, it's true for me. I'm pretty sure it's a thing. Like if you're hurting others. Exactly. Not really a thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's flip that should, around. should be a big red flag if your truth is, yeah, it's, it's me. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's hurting a lot of people though. Exactly. It, exactly. It might be wrong. Exactly. But... exactly. You think that would be an easy lesson for some folks, but apparently, yeah. apparently it's not obvious. I know, right? Yeah. People are a little confused. Really? Tough, tough times people get confused it's true this is true <laughs> well and then you know it's things like education and art that kind of tune people back in like oh you, you know i forgot forgot who i was there for a minute absolutely absolutely forgot who i was forgot that i have a cosmic purpose forgot that other people have value you know oh look at that painting that reminds me of so-and-so or that oh maybe they have depth you know um absolutely absolutely a nice. great purpose for art and a great purpose for uh, education and educators as well yeah I, well i really appreciate that i just you know look around sometimes and it can be easy to despair at our current moment and then you go ah, we're not doing enough we need to do more and then sometimes like well sometimes it's not that we need to do more and sometimes we need to realize what we're already doing what we already have and uh, and your work really does that like no there's actually a lot more out there than you know there's a lot more power uh, the cosmic purpose is still there even if you forgot about it even if you've ignored <laughs> it it's still there you can still reconnect you can still tune in That's uh, so i really appreciate that a lot of a lot of optimism uh despite the fact that you're also turning a very serious look to the truths of injustice and pain in the world um, but not in a way that you know just wallows in a valley of despair yeah, um, that, that wouldn't be good for me or anyone else. Um, yeah. Even though I might have just cause for sure. <laughs> a lot of people have just cause to, um, you know, to hold despair. But also, you know, that's not the the legacy that I that I come from. You know, that's that's my I wouldn't be here if my ancestors had just wallowed in despair. They suffered, you know, really, really suffered, as are so many of us right now, really, really suffering. Um, but they they found joy, they found creativity, they fought for joy, they fought for to be able to be creative. Um, they, you know, they fought for their purpose, you know, and so I'm um, when I sometimes want to just throw the towel in, you know, um, I'm reminded again in so many ways that that's just not who I am. Yeah, that stubbornness comes back. Absolutely. <laughs> right on back. Absolutely. That's good. That's a good stubbornness. Good. I'll, I'll need to learn that. My kind of Aquarian nature, not too stubborn. Like, Pretty stubborn. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps. It's good to be around stubborn people. I'm like, oh, right. I forgot. Forgot that was an option. <laughs> Just come stand next to us, Virgos. Just yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, just radiating off of you. Just That's stand right. in the vicinity. Uh, right. Even even on Zoom, it, it still still comes through. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, uh, Nicole Dixon, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'll let you go for now, and I'll definitely uh, talk to you again sometime. We'll have you back on and do the the Montessori religion and ecology. <laughs> I kind of think because I'm curious. Every time I learn more, it just it always makes me more and more curious. Oh. Uh, so thanks so much for uh, for making time for us. Thank you so much, Sam. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for, for hosting this forum. I, it's, important. it's important. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, it's fun. It's a good excuse for me to just talk to people who I think are doing great work. Yay. Uh, so yeah, pretty, pretty fun. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks for being here. And, uh, and thanks for everybody else for, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, with more conversations for you. In the meantime, take care and be well.